Welcome to This Birding Life, a podcast for bird watchers everywhere. I'm your host, Bill Thompson III. This Birding Life comes to you from the friendly confines of Bird Watchers Digest, the magazine that's been entertaining and enthralling birders since 1978. Sample our latest issue at birdwatchersdigest-digital.com. This Birding Life is sponsored by Carl Zeiss Sports Optics, makers of the Victory SF Binocular and the Gavia Spotting Scope, two fine optical products created specifically for birding. Learn more at facebook.com slash Zeiss Birding. Additional support comes from the American Birding Expo, a not-to-be-missed annual marketplace for birders and nature enthusiasts. The Expo has something for everyone, which is why it's called the World of Birding in One Place. Learn more and buy your advance tickets at birdingexpo.com. This is episode 68, Three Fabulous Birding Festivals. Birders love to gather together, and there's no better gathering of the birding clan than at one of North America's 300-plus birding festivals. It gives us an opportunity to go birding together, to sharpen our skills, to listen to edifying presentations, shop for products and services, support conservation causes, and most of all, it connects us as a community of bird-loving enthusiasts. In this episode, I talked to three friends, all of whom manage annual birding festivals, one in Maine, one in West Virginia, and one in California. Let's start way up in New England with my friend Becky. My name is Becky Marvel. I'm from Maine, and I run the Acadia Birding Festival. Well, Becky, welcome to This Birding Life. Well, thank you. It's nice to see you again. We're sitting here in outside of uh, Freeport, Maine, in, the, in my friend Dee Dee's house, and we're taking a little bit of time to do have a quick conversation for the podcast and catch up. Um, Tell our listeners about the Acadia Birding Festival, and then I want to ask you some other specific questions about birding in, in Maine anyway. Okay, well, our festival, we have about 300 people that come to it and 40 guides, and we have field trips, numerous field trips in the morning and the afternoon. We have three keynote speakers this year, and the festival itself is a four-day event, and it's always that starts on the Thursday right after Memorial Day. Okay. And the name comes from the National Park, I'm assuming. That's right. Acadia National Park and the field trips are on Mount Desert Island, which is where Acadia National Park is located. Right. So why is it called Mount Desert Island? Is there a giant mound of dessert there? <laughs> well, some people say Mount Desert Island. And I've some heard that. Some say yeah. Mount Desert it comes from the French word. The, okay. the, the mountains, the tops of the mountains are bare, okay. deserted. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, I never knew that. And I did hear both desert and desert. Yes. I've heard yes. people say, okay, well, that's interesting. So um, what are some of the highlight birds that people come to see at the Acadia Birding Festival? Well, perhaps our biggest highlight bird is the Atlantic puffin. Mm, a lot of people bird, want it. Yes. Of and we have a pelagic boat trip that goes out on Saturday during the festival, Saturday morning. And we are for sure going to see that bird. Yeah. They nest on a nearby island, and we, the boat goes right to that island, nice. and we can watch the birds flying around. Another bird that is special is the spruce grouse Ooh. and some other boreal species, boreal chickadee, mm -hmm. gray jay. We have a lot of warblers that nest up in the boreal forest. So we do trips further north and down east, as we call it yeah. in Maine. Now explain down east for people who might not know what that means. Well, down east comes from the sailors many years ago because our prevailing winds are from the southwest, mm -hmm. so they blow the ships down east or toward the northeast direction. Okay. And that's my understanding. It's really up east. It's really up east. But yes. Sailors, <laughs> but the yeah. wind blows that way, so it's <laughs> downwind. So, so that's the easy way to go because the wind's yes. at your back, right? Yes. <laughs> right. Okay. So you're saying you're, you're basically committing here on the, on the podcast to say that there's a 100% success rate for people seeing puffins. Yes, if they do the pelagic trip <laughs> and if the pelagic trip goes. goes so right. that depends on the weather. Right. Uh, we have only had to cancel it once in all the years that I've been running the festival, okay. which is, I don't know, eight or nine years now. Right. And, and how long has the festival been going for? Well, we started in 1999, okay. so we're in our 19th year. Wow. 
That's and great. We changed the name in, oh, I don't know, maybe 2004, 2005. Okay. What was it before? It used to be called Warblers and Wildflowers. Oh, okay. And it was very small, local. And when we changed the name and started attracting keynote speakers, mm -hmm. famous speakers like Pete Dunne mm -hmm. came the first year. And that sort of started more people coming from yeah. afar. Yeah. And do you, do you draw people from all over the place? I mean, all over the U.S. and Canada? And we do indeed. A lot of people from California, Arizona, Texas, because they want to come see the Atlantic Puppet. Right, right. And we also have some out-of-country people. We've had folks from England. One year we had somebody from Australia. Oh, wow. I know this year already I have 200 registrants um, that have uh, already committed to coming. And they, I think of those, there's three or four that are out of the country. Isn't that something? Of course, you also have the, the far northern breeding warblers. The timing of the festival is what? So we're right after Memorial Day okay. every year, and it's Thursday through Sunday. And we, but we also have pre- and post-festival trips. Okay. So if you take those into consideration, it goes for a whole week. Wow, okay. The, the, most of the warblers are back on territory by then, I would guess. Yes, yes. And the reason we've picked that time frame is because the, it, the warblers are still singing yep. and nesting. Right. And if we waited too much later, they would start to not be singing as much. Right. So we're at the cusp of that time period. Territoriality of the males. And, right. Yeah. But we also want to be at a time period at the beginning of the seabirds right. arriving. Right. So we're splitting the difference between right. those two. And is there a, do you have to factor in when the tourist season is up here? Because, I mean, Maine is vacation land USA, right? It's true. It, and tourists don't come more until July and August or later in June, so we don't overlap too much, which is great. But that being said, if all the birds happen to arrive in July, right. we, would, would have... we would have the festival <laughs> then anyway. We'd right. have to just deal with You'd it. You'd have to. So, the, uh, so a typical day at the festival, describe that. Okay. Uh, our trips generally start around 6 a.m. in the morning, and there may be seven to nine field trips each morning. Mm -hmm. And you drive to the location of your field trip, which a lot of them are on Mount Desert Island. And they go for about three hours, three to four hours. Mm -hmm. And then we come back to Festival Center that we have right in the center of the island. So it's easy. Nothing is very far right. to get to. And there we serve lunch. And at 1.30 folks go off to another field trip okay. if they want. It's a paper event, so you can pick as much or as little a carte as you want. Thing. A la carte, yes. Nice. And then in the evening, we have a social and a keynote speaker mm -hmm. uh, for three of the nights, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. Okay. Isn't there one... I remember when I came up here a few years ago to the festival, there was one night that we went out and had dinner. Yes. A, like so, a lobster place or something. Yes. Saturday night, <laughs> we go out for a lobster dinner. Okay. And we go over to a place, Thurston's Lobster Pound, which is well known. It's right on the harbor, in right. Bass Harbor. Beautiful views, and they serve us lobster. And we usually right. have 90 to 100 people that right. attend that <clears throat> event. Bad place to be a lobster. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> True. Um, if people wanted to find out more about the festival, Becky, what, what, where could they look for that? Okay. We have a website, acadiabirdingfestival.com. And it has lots and lots of information about the festival. It has the schedule. We also have eBird lists that show what has been seen previous years. Oh, so that's if you want to check and yeah. see mm -hmm. where you might want to go to get certain birds. Mm -hmm. So other than the other than the puffin, uh, the possibility of seeing an Atlantic puffin, what would you say sets the Acadia Birding Festival apart from? from other festivals around the country? Because I've seen you. We, we've run into each other at probably five or six different events around the country, and right. you're well-traveled. You, you've seen these other events. What, what would you say sets the ABF apart? Okay, what I like to do, and, and I've noticed this, that when I go to other festivals to learn about how they run things, a lot of the field trips are large, yeah. a lot of people, and I've tried to keep the, the trips very small numbers. Mm -hmm. So a lot of our trips will only have 10 to 12 people. Right. And there will always be two guides 
Okay. And if it goes up to more people, there will be three guides yeah. and four guides, possibly, but we never go over 20, right. 20 people. And there will always be a ratio of around one guide to five people. That's really good. So I try yeah, that, That's hard to beat. Indeed. Indeed. Um, some of the challenges to birding in, the, in this part of the world are, you know, it can be like it is today, kind of rainy and wet. It can be beautiful. And if it's beautiful, yeah. it can be a little buggy sometimes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, you tell you give people all that preparation information on the website, I'm sure. Right. Well, it's, it's good to bring bug spray. And every year I have people call me and ask about how bad the black flies are, okay. how bad the mosquitoes are. They're, Aren't you kind of before the black flies, really, though? Yeah, well, there, are, there can be some, but on Mount Desert Island, I don't find it very bad yeah. at yeah. all. Now, we do have trips that go inland and down east for the boreal species, mm -hmm. and I suspect there's more problems there, mm -hmm. but it's nothing that a bug spray can't handle. Yeah, well, that's good. I mean, and, but your birders are intrepid people. They know that if you want to get good birds, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to stick your neck out there or something. Right. Um, tell me about the legend of Bruce the Spruce Grouse. <laughs> oh, well, and that's a sore point with me because I... <laughs> Missed that. Oh bird. dear. Okay. Yeah, I think I may be the only person in the history of the festival that's missed it. <laughs> well, Bob Duchesne is one of our guides during the festival, and he often does the down east trips to find the spruce grouse. Right. And he visits these spots quite frequently to determine whether Bruce the spruce grouse is still there. <laughs> and I can't tell you exactly when he discovered Bruce. Right. But he is aware of Bruce and several, perhaps, siblings and children. Yeah. I'm not sure. But he named Bruce the Spruce Grouse and has been following him for many years in this one location. Mm -hmm. So he always goes back to try to get him. But it's n not a sure thing. It's not guaranteed. <laughs> no, I, as I found out. But isn't Bruce sort of, like, accustomed to people hiking along the trail or whatever where it is? And he's kind of, I mean, he's, uh, he's a fairly familiar bird. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Not for me. I no. must I had spruce grouse repellent on. I've seen him once. Yeah. And all the yeah. times you've gone. Okay. Yes. But I haven't been that many times. When I run the festival, I don't get to go on these right. great trips. As, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What do you think is the, what's your favorite thing about running the festival? Well, my background is computer programming mm -hmm. and birding. And for me, the fun part is I bring those two interests together. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoy meeting all the people, doing the registration, talking to people, making things run as smoothly as possible, trying to make it more efficient each year. But just the camaraderie mm -hmm. of seeing everybody, I love it. Yeah, you got, you've got a great community of birders up here. I, I experienced that when I was here a few years ago, and I was very impressed with it. And boy, we had great weather and great birds. and. Um, it's, a, it's a really fun festival. I highly recommend it. So thanks for talking with us today, You're Becky. You're very welcome. Great to see you again, and I hope we'll be seeing you again uh, in the future. Yes, I'm hoping you'll be my keynote again. <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> thanks, Becky. From Maine, let's head to the mountains of West Virginia and talk with my old buddy, Jeff. Okay, uh, joining us now is Jeff Heater from Opossum Creek Retreat and also one of the founders of the New River Birding Festival, one of the uh, longer running and more well-known of the uh, festivals in the eastern half of the United States. Welcome, Jeff, to this birding life. Hi, Bill. Great to be here. <laughs> so how did the New River Birding Festival, I'm sorry, New River Birding and Nature there Festival we go. get started? Uh, Dave and I were at a tourism conference. This and is Dave Pollard. Dave Pollard and I were at the tourism, uh, tur Corridor L Tourism Conference. And it was one of those sessions where you put ideas up on the board and, you know, there's a hundred some people there. And then you all put your sticky notes on the ones you think that'll work. Well, right. the birding festival got two votes, Dave and I's, and other projects, you know, got right. dozens and dozens of votes. Well, in the end, we were walking down the hall and Dave said, I think we can do this. I think we can do this. And long story short none of those other ideas got to fruition really? and 15 years later we have a you're still going we're still going what's corridor l corridor l is the highway okay. highway 19 okay and so we used to have a little uh, spring tourism conference uh, sponsored by our chamber of commerce 
at our um, CVB right. Convention Visitors Bureau. Um, so they and they've both been very supportive of our efforts mm -hmm. to the the original thought was let's fill that um, shoulder season. Right. We know we have something that's really fun. Or we thought it's fun birding, and there's lots of birds here, and maybe we can. Um, fill some lodging up, get some participation from our local right. tourism stuff. Because you, because you have a big season here anyway. And what what are people coming here to do? The New River Gorge. And the New River Gorge is a national park, part of the Park Service, um, and we have several other parks around us: uh, three state parks, Bluestone, Babcock, and Hawks Nest. And we have a national um, recreation area, the Golly River. I mean, I'm forgetting something too. Um, but the, there are huge, world-renowned attractions. One is rafting, right. then both white, white, water white, rafting. white water rafting and and scenic rafting. The the part that always gets overshadowed by the white water. But there's really some beautiful family floats on the new. Um, and the Gali River is a top white water experience, one of the top ones in the world, um, by all estimations. World-class climbing. The Endless Wall is known all over the world for sport routes mm -hmm. and um, for climbers. We now have um, bunches of aerial adventures. You know, the zip lines, they're kind of all the rage, and everybody's right. got, we've got some great zip lines here. We've got some great um, jungle gym type things up in the trees. Mm -hmm. And um, the surprise thing for me really is the mountain biking is huge. There are yeah. mountain bikers coming from all over to ride mountain bikes on our trails. Right. And, and how does uh, how does birding fit into that? Those seasons are, I would guess, largely the warm weather yeah. months. Yeah, yeah, that's um, climbers like it a little bit cool. Right. But um, rafting is definitely a little bit in the spring when it's high water, summer, and then definitely fall. And our shoulder season is that springtime when it's you know springtime's magical in the eastern hardwood forests, and and that's what we have a you know, migrating birds and beautiful flowers popping everywhere and trees blooming. It's awesome. And what are the sort of keystone magnet species that people come to the New River Festival for? Um, I I would say there's a couple of really obvious ones. The Swainson's Warbler uh, is an amazingly skulky and shy bird um, that we've been able to find um, pretty regularly, mm -hmm. um, and we have a, a really unique habitat for them. Um, they're usually found further south, you know, in really dense, thick cane breaks and stuff right. like that. And here they're in in rhododendron, um, which can be, you know, obviously very thick, mm -hmm. dense carpet of rhododendron throughout the forest floor. But then they like to poke their head up out of that and sing right. um, to proclaim their... <laughs> <laughs> Territory Territory. Yes, everything I see, I own. Right. So there. Um, so the Swainsons is definitely something people really love to come and see. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it was Tom Stevenson who said this may be the best place around to observe Swainson's warblers, right. not just see them. Golden wing warbler mm -hmm. is magical. It's, got, it's clearly one of my personal favorites. Um, really hard over we had not seen it for a couple of years during the festival um, habitat changes dramatically for them blue wings push them out um, they get a lot of attention and so we were really excited when we found some yeah uh, this year i think everybody that wanted to see one pretty much got to this week right? yeah that was um that's good that was great that's a that's really a cool bird for me and um cerulean warbler is um, just captivates people. Right. That is probably the the other you know if there's a triad of mm -hmm. um, birds that people are are coming here to see. I would say those are the three. And uh, yeah, when when people come back from a trip and say there were ceruleans dripping off the branches, it's right. it's pretty pretty, it's pretty cool. And you're right in the heart of their, their yeah. range here. Yes, this is the thick of it. There's, uh, and we have a lot of mature canopy forest, which they like. Right. Um, with grapevines. With grapevines, right and yeah, you know, they love to mix it up with the red starts and the mm -hmm. yellow-throated vireos and that stuff. 
And uh, you, with the festival, the proceeds from the festival go to a special fund, is that correct? Yes. The, well, the Fayette County Education Fund is a 501c3 nonprofit um, which administers the festival. And we also do um, programming in our local schools. So the, when we realized 15 years ago, oops, oops this is going to work, um, people want to come and go birding, right. we realized uh, very quickly that um, we had the opportunity to capture, to use ecotourism or tourism, however you want to phrase it, to help us solve some of our local problems and, and one of our dire issues in Fayette County and really throughout the country is education and providing uh, opportunities for kids that um, they may not have in the classroom. So we spend um, all the money we make, um, all the proceeds go to um, a leadership program which is for high school juniors. It's a competitive process to get in. We get over 40 applicants from all five high schools and we have to sadly whittle it down to about 14 people. Okay. Those kids each get a thousand dollar scholarship at the end of the 12 day long sessions. So they get out of school which is <laughs> one of the reasons they like to try and get in. <laughs> Woo! We're out of school! <laughs> and uh, and so it's a it's a leadership program that's designed in large part to help them fall in love and learn and know more about their community so that maybe one day after they've gone out and um, made their way in the world uh, they would find it worthwhile to come home yeah. and has have, do you have any uh, anecdotal evidence that that's working over the years yeah actually we're really thrilled um, we have come full circle one of the kids who was in a program early on um, went off to college, did their thing, um, came home and started working for a tourism company here, one of the big raft companies, adventure companies, and um, she's now on our board of oh, directors. Yeah, awesome. yeah. So we were really excited um, that we now have somebody who's been through the program and, you know, really kind of fulfilled the mission. Mm -hmm. Um, on our board to help us grow and improve the programming. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So, uh, describe a typical day here at the New River Burning and Nature Festival. What's a? Uh, I know no day is typical. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. That. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah. Um, so, just kind of the itinerary maybe would be, um, we start out with uh, breakfast over at Burnwood mm -hmm. Campground, which is part of the. Uh, park and we feed everybody a hearty breakfast and then we split up into uh, typically uh, four trips four different trips each day um, so we have breakfast everybody hangs out chats get, where are you going where are you going what are you doing what did you see yesterday and we're out of there by seven um, we may load up on a school bus and take off with you know 15 or 20 people um, and three or four guides, four or five guides sometimes, and head out to a destination. We may climb in our own cars and carpool to a spot nearby. Mm -hmm. um, and then our premium trips, we rent a couple of uh, big SUVs, and it would be four or five guests in each SUV with a guide um, driving. Then we're out for the day. We pack a lunch. We carry lunch and have picnics mm -hmm. wherever we end up. Then we come back. Some trips don't come back till dinner time. Some trips come back at two o'clock. Uh, three o'clock in the afternoon here at Possum Creek, where we serve the evening meal. Uh, we have some fun programs, a little lighthearted, more lighthearted than the um, more um, than the keynotes every evening. So three o'clock is popcorn talk, or you can do whatever you want. Nothing's mandatory. Uh, six o'clock is dinner time. All local um, chefs that prepare food from the restaurants in the area, which we're famous for. That's the yeah. other thing I should have mentioned, why people come to Fayetteville. Some people come just to eat. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then at 7 o'clock, so 6 o'clock is dinner, 7 o'clock is a uh, presentation by a well-known uh, rock star of the birding world, an author, mm -hmm. uh, a world traveler, somebody who does uh, birding in a big, big way. And then we rinse and repeat. 
and uh, you get a lot of repeat visitors here. Yeah. I was astounded on my trip yesterday that asking people, hey, uh, it's pretty nasty weather. We're not going to make it all. It would, be okay, would it be okay if we didn't go all the way down to the bottom to the golly to see the Swainson's Warbler? Does anybody still need Swainson's Warbler for a life bird? And nobody needed it. I mean, that's bizarre. That's <laughs> unheard of. I mean, right. the, the rarest bird here, practically, I guess probably maybe golden wing could be a little rarer, but the hardest to find bird, you got to really kind of get into the exact right habitat, and everyone had already seen them. So yeah. that's, that's a testament, I think, to the thoroughness of the trips and the fact that you got a lot of people who've been here previous years. And um, it's humbling. Yeah. It really is to have um, so many people uh, come back uh, year after year, and if not year after year, you know, we're on their calendar and they do it in a rotation with other events or yeah. other vacations. Um, and how many people totally do you typically have during um, the week? During the week, um, we'll have any, on any day, we'll have, say, 50 to 80 guests, and then... Um, 15 to 20 guides, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to make sure that there's a good uh, guide to guest ratio. Uh, we want to, we don't want to leave anybody um, unattended. Right. So listeners want to know more about the festival for uh, 2018 and beyond? Yeah. Um, they can go to birding-wv.com and that can tell you a lot about our event and what we do and how we do it. Um, registration will not be open until probably uh, early fall, I would say. Okay. Uh, it's it's a total volunteer organization, so it takes us a little while to recover and get our stuff together for Very the food. full. Yeah. yeah. Um, but by fall, we'll have everything up and running. And um, I've heard before, oh, we didn't come to New River because we thought you always sold out. Right. And that's not the case. Um, you know, some of the um, choice lodging sells out right away or the what people the closest lodging but there's plenty of lodging there's plenty of space on trips so we'd be happy to have we get about 50 50 50 percent repeats and 50 percent new faces yeah. well jeff always a pleasure to be here for the week at uh, at the new river birding and nature festival always fun to hang out with you continued success in all your many uh, hats that you wear <laughs> yoga pants that you wear yeah, that's crocs true. with socks I'm crocs right. with socks it's a little which chilly is, out here it's a fashion faux pas but we'll we'll, that's, we'll save that for another podcast okay anyway, thanks jeff good to see you buddy. thanks bill love you bye the final stop in our birding festival tour is in san diego california with my talented friend jen hi jen welcome to this birding life it's great to see you it's good to see you too thank you so much for having me yeah, now, when I say see you, I'm seeing you on Skype. So we're recording this on Skype, and if anybody, if we sound slightly robotic, it's let's blame it on Skype. How about, okay? Okay. <laughs> so where are you right now? I'm in Salt Lake City. Okay. Having Enjoying the beautiful weather out here and the great views of the lake from, from just right across the room from me. It's awesome. Yeah, that's your old home <laughs> uh, ground, right? Your old stomping ground? Yeah, used to live here. I was here like 30 years or so. Wow. Tell us the birding festival that you're affiliated with currently. I coordinate the San Diego Bird Festival, located in Mission Bay. In Mission Bay, California? Yes. Okay. And how long has the, the San Diego Birding Festival, Bird Festival rather, been going? We've been doing it for over 20 years now. Wow. Okay. That's impressive. And how many years have you been involved? About, oh... Five, I think, okay. about five. So for people who may have never been there or experienced the San Diego Bird Festival, what, what can you tell us about it? What are, the, what are the main attractions that lure people from around the world and across North America to come out there for the festival? Well, I think some of the main attractions are, um, first of all, we have a really impressive list. Um, our checklist of birds is very long. Um, and considered to be one of the longest lists in any county in the United States. So um, the first thing would just be the, the number of birds that you could see uh, at our festival. Um, we also have our, our pelagic trips, which go out to three days of the four-day festival. And those are pretty popular, um, give you a, a nice access to those pelagic birds that, that live out, that spend most of their time out at sea, never come inland. So that, that's another highlight. 
Um, another thing that we do, which is different than I think a lot of other festivals, is we have other modes of birding. So we have a birding by bike field trip uh, oh, that cool. goes along. It, you, you can choose to go about 24 miles on that trip if you want. Wow. <laughs> you don't have to, but it, it can be a pretty extensive bike trip if you want. Um, and we have birding by kayak and, and some other interesting ways to bird. Yeah, and I seem to remember being on a pelagic trip there a few years ago when I was out at the festival, and we were well out to sea, and I believe steaming pretty far south, and at one point, over the loudspeaker on the on the boat, they uh, La Cucaracha played, I think, uh, the <laughs> captain played, and and I I said, what what's that for? And Steve Howell was there, and he said, oh, we just crossed the uh, line into Mexico, so these birds don't count on your U.S. list. <laughs> which was hilarious. I thought that was a great way instead of getting on there saying, all right, everybody, we've just passed over the international border. Um, yeah, no wall out there, I noticed, in the in the ocean. No wall. Um, but uh, so, I, and I remember a fantastic array of pelagic birds. I mean, albatrosses and auklets and all kinds of stuff like that. So is that typical for a, a San Diego pelagic trip? Yeah, I mean, we, we get the shearwaters, um, we, we see a, a variety of gulls, um, auklets, um, mirrors, um, occasionally an albatross. That is something mm -hmm. that, that's a, a little less common. Yeah. Um, and yeah. sometimes we get um, some of the boobies as well. Always nice to go looking for boobies. Always nice. No, Nobody wants to miss a, ch a chance at that. <laughs> um, and the so the other neat thing that I remember about San Diego is you could bird a lot of different biomes mm -hmm. um, in the course of three or four days. Yeah, it's one of the largest counties in the U.S. and it spans from the coast and inland to the desert. And um, in between, there are mountains, uh, there are um, scrublands, um, there, there's chaparral, um, there's estuary land. I mean, it's a little bit of everything. And, yeah. and so you can, you can get a lot of different kinds of birds just by going to a different part of the county. And so what are some of the, we've talked about some of the, uh, seabirds that, that people would get there. What are some of the other highlight birds that when, when people are registering for the festival, they're like, oh, I want to go on a trip that sees this. What are some of the other birds that people are flagging for you that they want to see? We have um, the, the California birds, um, like the California gnatcatcher, um, mm -hmm. the the California towhee. Um, the, there's a, a list of birds that are that are specialists down in in our county, um, and in California. Um, we also have um, the Ridgeways rail. That's one that people are always looking for and wanting oh, to get. Oh yeah, is that the uh, light-footed clapper rail? Yeah, the white wooded wood ways well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the okay. I didn't know they I changed it to Ridgeways. It. <laughs> yeah, well, that's good. It always ends up sounding like Elmer Fudd. Right. <laughs> um, but we have that, um, and uh, then um, we have some exotics that you can see as well. Um, there's a growing parrot population, oh. so um, a number of different kinds of parrots that you can catch. Yeah. And what's the um, what's the, the the fantastic jay that's along the border there? Oh, the um, the black throated magpie jay. Yeah. Right. That um, he he he's seen um, down by the border. Um, it's really considered a right. Mexican bird, um, and, but yeah. there there's a small group of them that hang out um, near the horse pastures on the border. So sometimes if you get there at the right time, you can see them. Yeah. Okay. And um, in addition to the field trips, the festival also has a nice vendor area, as I recall, and you do you do some programming as well. Yeah, we do a lot of workshops. Um, the, for the 2018 festival, we're focusing on species ID uh, and also tourism. So different locations where you can go and, and see the birds of the world. Neat. And uh, how big is your vendor area? How many vendors do you have? We'll have around 25 vendors this year. Our vendor area is pretty small compared to other festivals, yeah. but we, we do try to have the big names there. And it's a good opportunity for you to have some, uh, you know, quality time with the people who ha are in the know about the birding business. Mm -hmm. And what's a typical day at the festival? 
typical day, people show up around five o'clock in the morning for breakfast. We feed people, we give them breakfast, which is kind of different. Um, we have a, awesome. a breakfast sponsored, awesome. usually sponsored by SeaWorld. Um, and then we, um, we get onto our field trips from there and um, people just kind of go out to all, all corners of the county and bird all day. And then they come back and we have a mixer uh, where we can share stories. And we often have an evening program featuring one of our main speakers. You're going to be one of our speakers. I'm in excited about that. Yeah. 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 So we'll have you on our Thursday night program talking about cool things, as you often do. Well, we'll see. I mean, it, it, the, the jury's out on that. Um, we're not really sure. Um, and then uh, uh, one of the other things that I think is, is notable about the San Diego Bird Festival is the setting where basically festival headquarters, the vendor area, the mixer, the field trips meet and stuff. It, it's, it's very picturesque there. Yeah. Yeah. We're in the Marina village conference center, which is right on the water at mission Bay. So there's a little Marina out there. We, when we go to the pelagic trips, we just walk across uh, and get on our boat, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, and the estuary, the, the San Diego River estuary, is just a hop, skip, and a jump away from where we are. So we can go out there and look at the bird life during the different times of the day. The tides um, affect what's out there, and uh, it, can be, it can be really interesting to watch throughout the day. Yeah. Well, neat. So if people want to learn more about the festival, where can they point their browsers? SanDiegoAudubon.org and then follow the links to um, events and bird festival is under under that and and how many people do you typically have at one of the fests we usually bring in about 500 serious birders from around the u.s and canada sometimes from other mm -hmm. countries as well and um, we also have a, a family activities day which is the sunday of the festival where um, mm -hmm. we have anywhere between about 200 people and about 700 people showing up on that day. Wow. Um, yeah, they don't pre-register, so we, we never really know what to plan for. Yeah, well, that's really cool. I want to switch gears now, Jen, because there's something else that, that is, is interesting about you, that you're a, a musician, singer, songwriter, performer, and that's what you do with most of the rest of your life, I think, isn't it, when you're not planning the Bird Festival? Yes. Okay, so describe your music for people. Yeah, um, I, my music is, it tends to be uh, on the folk end of things uh, or the adult contemporary. Um, I do a, a lot of music that uh, is, is kind of calming and, and quiet. Um, and I have a whole section of songs that I've written that are about the ecology of raptors. Um, <laughs> it's kind of specialized cool. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and yeah. it's been really fun coming up with those songs. Uh, gosh, it's been years since I've performed any of those though. Uh, but they're, they're definitely well, favorites of mine. We'll have to have a performance at the festival next spring. Maybe we can play some music together. I think that would be super fun. Uh, I, I, I really yeah. enjoy playing music with you cause, cause you're yeah. awesome. Now, do you, do you feel that there are, um, there's a special connection that bird people have that are also musicians. I mean, like I, I've noticed over the years, and my dad was the first one to point this out decades ago. He said, I think the same ears you use for music, you can use for birding. And boy, I've, I've just met lots of people who were really good musicians and also really good, you know, birding by ear people. And also lots of my birder friends are also have really good taste in music. They were like really into music, even if they're not necessarily musicians themselves. Do you, do you find that connection between birds and music to be something uh, evident? Yeah, and or, or maybe it just gives us one other thing to, to connect over. Um, you know, uh, in yeah. the folk music yeah. world, occasionally I run into a folk musician who's also a birder. And um, we, it's like we're in this secret club, you know, we, we wink at each <laughs> other and go, oh, we know what that bird at, that is, you know, or, or whatever. That's right. Um, it's it's just one more thing that that can make somebody your friend. Yeah, isn't that cool? Um, so if people want to learn more about your music, where can they go, Jen? Oh, I have a website. It's jenhaj.com, um, J-E-N-H-A-J-J.com. 
and it gives you my touring schedule. Um, you can listen to some of my songs. I think the Raptor Bird song might be on there. <laughs> All right. <Yay. laughs> That's great. Well, Jen, it's always a thrill and a, a real pleasure to talk to you and uh, look forward to seeing you next February uh, at, at the San Diego Bird Festival. I can't wait. And I know. So keep on playing. And thanks again for talking to us. Thanks, Bill. I really appreciate you. Thanks to Becky, Jeff, and Jen for their time and insight. To learn more about these and hundreds of other birding festivals, visit the Festival Finder on the Birdwatcher's Digest website at birdwatchersdigest.com slash festivals. Thanks to Birdwatcher's Digest for letting us post up this podcast for the past decade. If you don't read Birdwatcher's Digest, you really should. Learn more at birdwatchersdigest.com. Huge gratitude to Carl Zeiss Sports Optics, makers of fine optics for discerning birders. Join the Zeiss community of birders at facebook.com slash Zeiss Birding. Thanks, too, to the American Birding Expo, bringing you the world of birding in one place this September 29 to October 1, 2017, at the Greater Philadelphia Expo Center in Oaks, Pennsylvania. Learn more at birdingexpo.com, and don't miss the expo. And thanks to you, yes, you, for lending us your ears for yet another episode of This Birding Life. Until next time, take care, and I'll see you out there with the birds. Which, by the way, is another podcast I'm part of with my buddy Ben Listus. It's called, duh, Out There with the Birds. Check it out. Just Google Out There with the Birds podcast. Okay, I'm out. Laters. Laters.